kind of like an FYI. Um, I was diagnosed in February 2014, but in retrospect, I'm showing symptoms the way back. As far as 2009 it was, my eye, it was the first time my eyelids started drooping. And I was actually able to get Medicare and pay for ptosis repair, mm -hmm. which was, it's not, even, it's, a little, it's not cosmetic, but it is. They come up and they just tighten that muscle. Yeah. And that happened, happened to Greg yeah, I felt fatigued all the time. I had headaches because I was trying to compensate for it. And it just helped my spirit as far as my eyes were. Uh, and the other thing is, if you've already been diagnosed, it's too late. Uh, but if you were doing with financial planning, and they're going to go through with you and show you insurance that you can whatever, and long-term care insurance is very expensive. A lot of people cannot afford it. But almost all companies will have respite care. That is not all that expensive. And I made sure when I was doing that, all my companies had a month of respite care every year. The policy was costing about $800 to $1,000 a year for that. And uh, we took care of some of the that one as well. So just two FYIs. That's a great tip. And um, you know, as part of the multidisciplinary approach, someone I rely very heavily on is our social worker, who, who knows a lot of this, you know, more, much more about these kinds of, you know more about it than I do. Um, but these things can make a real impact in people's lives. And, um, you know, and so I usually get her involved quite early on. And, very, very helpful. And looking at the benefits, looking at the, at the insurance um, is, is incredibly important. That's a good point about the rest of it. I didn't know that. So that's really good. Yeah, they, they, they all have happen now. And uh, if, you're, if your planner is an insurance person, you start with insurance people, they may not mention it because the premium is so low. Mm -hmm. But from, in our case, from since we did take care of our great country, uh, and what the disruption was for our entire family, that if you haven't had been able to for a month away, whether that person was in a facility or we just paid for somebody else to take care of it, then there's a huge difference in the world. Absolutely huge. Well, and even the other point you bring up about the you know, eyelid surgery, again, is very intertwined with the living get reimbursed when we pay for it, because otherwise it becomes a lot harder to do. And so, yeah, so. Because, you know, for me, it was very depressing to both higher levels. Yes, um, wow, that was loud, sorry. So, two questions about psychiatric treatment. Yeah. One is, uh, are you, do you find in the research that, that uh, there's one uh, class of antidepressants that seems more effective uh, than others? And if you could speak to any differences uh, you might notice in people who had pre-existing psychiatric illness to, to the PSP. Yeah, those are, those are great questions. So the, this, the category we rely on a lot of medications is called, we call them SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which is a, you know, a group of medications which are really quite similar to each other. These are minor differences. Um, the reason, they're not any more efficacious than the older classes. They just tend to be better tolerated. Um, and especially people with kind of motor neurologic issues, um, you know, we want, a lot of our concern is not to add to the problem. So, so that's almost always our kind of first line agent. Now, among those, they're really pretty equivalent. Um, that being said, you know, people are a little idiosyncratic. Some people will respond to one, not the other. So sometimes we have to kind of go through a couple um, before. Or, you know, one, one thing, and this ties a little bit into your second question, I always ask is, have they been on something that worked in the past? That sort of kind of trumps, you know, uh, uh, what you might take. Without any of that history, you know, I'll generally take as a first line agent things which have relatively few medication interactions um, and are uh, you know, basically the cleanest kind of medication. So ones that, that I use a lot of are uh, citalopram, Selexa, S-citalopram, which is another form of it, or sertraline or so on, kind of thing. 
if, if there's, or every, there's no other reason to pick anything else, those are kind of my go-to agents. Um, now, you know, the past history is, is, is very interesting. So, you know, I kind of glossed over a little bit, but, um, you know, one thing, and this, uh, I'm interested in this in my research, too, is, is, is that there's really kind of a distinction to be made between um, symptoms that are FTD-like and psychiatric symptoms. So, um, usually when people have a psychiatric history, it's either depression, anxiety, or something like that, it's characterized by a uh, fair amount of distress is one of the kind of defining features of this disorders. And, you know, usually will, for the most part, respond pretty well to medication treatment. In contrast, can be FTD symptoms, which are usually not characterized by distress. So my FTD patients, you know, they, they're not particularly feeling down or anxious. They're withdrawn, they're apathetic, they have a kind of frontal syndrome. So characterized not by distress, not doesn't respond really as well to medications generally. So um, you know, always when I'm seeing patients, I'm kind of distinguishing those. So usually people will have a past history of, um, of depression, you know, say depression, um, but then they may be presenting with a more frontal syndrome, or they may be presenting with depression. And but the, the important thing to distinguish is again, kind of response to treatment is very different. Your kind of interpretation of it is different. You know, so a lot of times, and again, I'm, you know, not families, there's no reason they should know this. A lot of times families will come to me and say, my loved one is, is very depressed. And then I examine them and I say, well, you know, actually, they're apathetic. They're, they're kind of more withdrawn. And it changes, you know, our prognosis. Or, um, so, yeah, so you always got to be careful, even if someone has a history of depression, kind of what are they looking like now? And another question I ask a lot of families and patients is, does this look like it did 20 years ago, or does this look different? You know, and often people say, this is actually different, you know? So, um, yeah. But it can make it a little harder to distinguish, you know, and especially, uh, yeah. For a lot of my, you know, the PSP is a little different because, because it has the prominent motor symptoms, but for most of my FTD patients, they actually also get diagnosed with probably the psychiatric disorder, misdiagnosed initially, because people kind of confuse the apathy and depression. I don't know if that kind of, yeah. Any questions, other thoughts? Yeah, hi. You know, patients with not having pre-psychiatric conditions, do you have any opinion on use of like TCAs, you know, tricyclics in a low dose, you know, getting maybe some benefit with neuromuscular in addition to the yeah. cognitive? The, the tricyclics, so those are the older ones. Yeah, LDL, they, LDL, they for, for psychiatric purposes, they work just as well. Just, just you know, no not contraindicated. Well, the problem is that they tend to have more, more, they, they're more complicated in the receptors they affect than the, their serotonin. The, you know, the, 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 the first S in the SSR is the selective serotonin, yeah. which is why we kind of, the, the tricyclics um, have act on many other neurotransmitters, especially notably the anticholinergic transmitters. The reason we don't like that as much, so sometimes people want that, and sometimes the neurologists want that. They can be useful, so, so it can be useful to drive secretions, um, it can be useful, you know, other effects of the, the anticholinergic effects. Um, so sometimes you want that. The problem is it can dull cognition, it can make people sleepy, um, it can slow down your gut, or it can make maybe dry mouth, you know, contrast. So, um, so they can be used, and I have patients on them, and sometimes, again, the neurologists will come on and we'll have a kind of conversation. Um, they're, so they're not absolutely contraindicated, but you kind of got to know, know where you're going. Yeah, because my mom has CBD, and we just switched her to a low-dose amitriptyline at wow. night, and she seems to be doing much better. Yeah, so it can help people sleep too. Yeah. So, so I, you know, I use them. Um, I, I have some patients I put on tricyclics, and just well, again, it's like it, it's just you gotta kind of make a justification why why you're using it. And I, I have two more questions. Yeah. Um, in reference to the um, alternative communication devices you mentioned. What, what would something like that be? Yeah, so that's, uh, you know, this comes up a little more, but so people have a significant dysarthria, it's a trouble, you know, trouble speaking. Often they can have, sometimes have it easier, and, and again, um, you know, Ashraf might be able to speak to this as well. They can have, uh, there are um, things now developed where they can, on a touch screen, can sometimes be easier than actually just than saying. Um, this comes up a lot, we also use it a lot for the ALS, uh, you know, where they have trouble dysarthria, but they know what the words are, what they're trying to say. Right. Um, they've gotten much, much better, so now, you know, it used to be these really expensive things, now it's on an iPad, you know, there's an iPad program. Yes, oh, like an app? Yeah, it's an app on an iPad. Because I know, like, Amazon has something called the Echo, where you can talk to it, and it does This is a little different, because this is... can't speak well, so. Yeah, if people have trouble speaking, it's, they can, 
So uh, what they can do is it's words and it's common phrases and have people they know too. So the, the apps I've seen. Do you know what that app might be called? Or I do. Do you have someone here? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, I have a great with working with folks in communication, and that was actually one of my questions. Um, there's Prolo to Go. Um, it's very easy to program. Um, picture icons, you can use real pictures, or you can um, view stock pictures. They have the word that it speaks loudly for you, and touch chat. And they tend to be about $3 for the apps, but they're easy to use. And, and she, she loves gadgets and iPads, so yes. that would be great. We, we can talk here. And then third question. I just add one thing, and the thing I found that I like about those also is you program them in with, with the people they know, with the picture, and the common phrases. So, you know, the same things come up over and over again. You know, I, I want to drink, or, you know, that kind of thing. So, it's smarter. It so it can, you can just hit one button and it'll do that whole thing. <laughs> and uh, in reference to the palliative care, um, yeah. you know, we won't put it off too long. I think that's the general thing. Uh, but my understanding was if I when I put her on hospice that she won't be as eligible for physical therapy and occupational therapy that that would be greatly limited. Do you know? So let me help. You know, let me kind of yeah, this great. That's a great question, great point. And um, so you know, palliative care. I, my wife is a palliative care physician, so I have some you know some other. I've heard more of the kind of story of it a little bit. Um, you know, they've kind of been rebranding themselves, and, uh, and what they've been trying to. Too, and I think it, 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 I agree with it, is that it's not just kind of for people who are dying. The palliative care is, a, is an approach of focusing on symptoms that really kind of should be from the beginning. And just kind of as, the, as these illnesses progress, the proportion of palliative care increases over time. You know? And you know, I, I kind of consider myself a, a palliative psychiatrist in the sense that a lot of the symptoms I'm addressing, I'm trying to improve symptomatology, I'm not curing the illness. But, um, so, you know, so yeah, so it sort of starts off, you know, the focus is on diagnosis, and then the palliation kind of expands. So I think as a general approach, there should be, you know, hopefully there's no kind of time where it's pre-palliative, post-palliative. It should be all the way through and integrated through. That being said, you know, because of medical you know, reimbursement and all that stuff, there is a time where people say, well, hospice, non-hospice, you know, and again, they have a very arbitrary six-month cutoff, which is, you know, all the models are based on cancer, which are really not so happy was a different generation, and you know, we've kind of said that over and over again. You know, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't change. It's it what? It's, she also has cancer. Oh, okay. so like a race. Maybe more applicable. Um, so, so is it? Yeah. So generally, you know, so when when people enter hospice, the the, the thing they're not supposed to be doing again is kind of um, you know, they they do say we're not you know supposed to be no code kind of these things that are very aggressive care. Things that are palliative, so for example, if physical therapy is helping mobility, if it's helping, you know, um, uh, prevent contractures, you know, that should be part of it. It should be reversed. And again, I find a lot of it, this, you know, a good social worker can really kind of make the case for those things and knows how to make it. So I rely a lot, like, on our social worker to tell me kind of what, what to say to kind of make these things kind of happen. In, you know, in, in the sense of you know how to present, you know, say that this is this is helping a person function better. And I'm sure it's Medicare. And it's really complicated and often very arbitrary, but as a general principle, and the argument I kind of try to make is, is this for the relief of symptoms? Um, and then it's, then I feel it's justified. And I often find the other way. So like I'm fighting, 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 and then once I get them into hospice, a lot of things open up. You know, and I kind of all of a sudden, I don't get, I don't get pushed back about something I'm asking for. I find it more often that way. Uh, my name is Eileen McFarland. I'm with the PSP organization. And I'd like to just share a personal story about palliative care and hospice. My husband, who died of PSP, um, spent the last two years in hospice, palliative care. I was his primary caregiver. The part of the story I want you to know is hospice was amazing. Um, I don't know what I would have done without them. Not all hospices offer palliative care. They each have different missions. So you have to find a hospice that offers palliative care. And it all has to do with billing Medicare. If they have a mission for palliative care, then they can bill Medicare. If they don't, they can't offer it because they can't bill it. Palliative care 
includes coming to your home, providing you with equipment, wheelchairs, walkers, lifts, uh, equipment, um, resources, depends, bed pads, cotton, medication, they'll deliver it to your door. Um, and while my husband was in hospice, uh, he continued his personal trainer at the gym. They offered PT, speech therapy. So I guess my point is, don't hesitate to do that. And hospice is not end of life. Hospice is a very supportive organization that offers a, a variable amount of support. If your loved one has to have um, a feeding tube, they will come and clean it. They send a nurse over. Um, they supply, uh, supply the supplies. Um, I can't even tell you how supportive it is. If you want to discuss this any further, I lived in Maryland at the time. Things vary from state to state, so if you have to do a little research. But don't give that up as a resource. It's a valuable resource. And again, it is not end of life. It's quality of life. Thank you. I, I totally agree with that. I very much agree with that and, and think it's an important message. And I'm repeating what you're saying, but I wouldn't let it, I would try not to let it be a psychological barrier that, that you're giving up on the person because you're not. You know. And actually, there's interesting studies now which show people, patients in, in hospice palliative care actually live as long as people getting more aggressive care, usually, um, for the same degree of illness and density. And it's not that they are, their lives are foreshortened by being involved in the program. So it's a way to get more resources. Um, I just have one quick, um, my sister and I are here, my parents didn't want to come, my father has PSD, and we noticed that everyone's able to sit, and he doesn't do that, he's up and down and up and down, and um, I'm not sure if maybe he does have a positive effect from the, the leaf dopa, crack dopa, mm -hmm. it, it helps with his rigidity and the pain that he feels, I think, um, but what would you think that would be attributed to? And, I so think sometimes it's false. Yeah, yeah, sometimes I can tie into these kind of repetitive, you know, behaviors. So a lot of my patients, uh, you know, when they're pitying, pitying, yeah, they do things over and over again and, and will pace or will get up repeatedly or will. Um, so sometimes, so, you know, as a general rule in terms of the pharmacology, if, if, if it's not a problem, we don't treat pharmacologically. But it can be a problem. So, you know, if it's, so the ways in which it's often a problem is people are getting up and down are higher risk for falling. And so, because it's contributing to fall risk, you know, there can be other kind of comorbidities. So if that's the case, generally we will treat, um, and usually, like again, the search and nurture gets SRI will be the first step. Um, I'll tell you, you know, often doesn't work. When it does work, usually it's a kind of re reduction. It doesn't go away, but we can kind of try to reduce it. But um, uh, that would be the first line. That would be kind of, they're secondary things, but uh, they're, they're more problematic. But that would be where I would start. pretty bad, but we're dealing with a component of major depression. Um, she was in a PC unit uh, for a while, and she went through a uh, partial day program for five days, and she's been on three different meds for depression. Um, nothing's really worked. Do you have any experience or any input about ECT treatment? So ECT, you know, people are often scared of it, but it, it, it's a valuable treatment modality. It's, it's kind of the gold standard of, uh, you know, in, of treatment. So in other words, people who don't respond to different kind of medications, um, uh, you know, can respond to ECT. Um, it has the best response rate of any. Um, Did you use it? I have, actually. I used to, I used to do ECT. I don't know, I don't know, but it can be miraculous. Um, it has 
you know, potential side effects, you know, uh, transient um, cognitive symptoms, um, but, uh, but it can be life-saving for right people. Now, let me just back up a little bit, which is that, um, you know, so depression in all neurodegenerative diseases is, is common, um, and you know, when we think of it, a lot of it is the actions, you know, whatever the, the, whatever the neurodegenerative disease is, it's affecting areas of the brain that, that, uh, that control mood, that are involved in the disease, all time um, generally, the presence of a neurodegenerative disorder for depression will lower uh, response rates. So if I see someone who you know, has a depression but has no neurodegenerative disease associated, generally my, treat, my success rate will be higher. So it's not uncommon for people with these other disorders to have refractory depression that's harder to treat and to respond as well. Um, but ECT is, is, a, is a valuable treatment. And again, I wouldn't. I would we reserve it for people who are refractory to medication treatment. Um, you know, we usually have kind of rules that they have to have you know, several full trials. And back when I used to do this, you review the trials, make sure they got to the appropriate dose at the right time, um, plus psychotherapy, which can also be helpful for depression. Um, but if someone has failed all of those, it can be a, a valuable treatment option. And it's not contraindicated for Parkinsonian disorders. Can I ask one last question? Sure. Just take a minute and tell us the difference about ECT as practiced in 2016 and as it was practiced 20 years ago. Yeah, it has a very bad rap. Yeah. But it, it has a very bad rap. It's, it's a much different process. Thank you for, for bringing that up. So the the um, the main one of the main differences is actually not the psychiatry side, it's the anesthesia side of it. So you know, whenever we do ECT, now we do it with an anesthesiologist. And what they do is they completely paralyze the person. So that almost all of the, the well, many of the physical um, you know, uh, problems people associated with it are the fact of the, the motor response to the ECT. So now we, we uh, make them so the person doesn't have the motor response and it's much better tolerated. Even kind of is much more, um, watching it is much more powerful because the person doesn't jerk around or anything like that. They, they um, you know, just receive the treatment. You know from the monitor they've been receiving it, but you don't see the, the seizure thing in the back. Yeah, so um, what do you mean? It's, oh yeah, it's gotten much, much better. And again, a lot of that is, is, is the anesthesiology. Uh, it's probably an underutilized treatment. Um, it's more than an underutilized treatment. Other questions? I do. Just one quick question. Sure. Yeah. Um, I know that the rules are Uh, you have to be 65 to qualify for Medicare. Yeah. Are there any types of conditions that people can get Medicare for other reasons? I see your hand. You're probably better at addressing this yeah. than I am. There are some Medicare eligible conditions. <laughs> there are some conditions. ESP might be one. Yeah. But even so, even without that, if you uh, went on disability and have been receiving your check for a year, then you become Medicare uh, eligible regardless of your age. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't have the full list of things that they will let you go to Medicare right away. You'd have to speak with your Medicare provider. Actually, believe it or not, Medicare is a pretty good website for government thing. Uh, it's unbelievable. But there are a few things that they let that you would be with diagnosis and from the doctor, boom, you're in. If not, you would apply for disability. Uh, once you become disabled, uh, you will receive a check after you've received your disability check for five years, then you will be uh, Medicare, Medicare eligible regardless of your age. Regardless of your age. You have to be five years having this disease? No, 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 no. What happens is if you've gone and you declare, if you've declared disability because of your disease, and you've, been, and you've been accepted as Social Security disabled. You would then go and uh, you have to wait five months for your first check. And then you go and once you receive your uh, disability check for a year, then you become Medicare eligible, regardless of age. Now, right, just a year after. Now, if you've already gone to your doctor, go back. Maybe the doctor can see that he can back your disability maybe by a month, maybe by a year. You can get your wait period over. If 
there's some documentation somewhere along, some other doctor that you've wanted, done that, and he says, I have new medical evidence and I want to reapply, and I want to reapply with using this as the start date. That will give you some money back from Medicare, and it will also have started your wait period before mm -hmm. you're eligible for Medicare. Can I just say is uh, to come and uh, talk to me with questions as well about how you get disability and, and the whole wait process because it's improved in the last few years. So please feel free to come talk. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Joy.